another way, O oh God, that we can give worship unto God. Amen. As we prepare to receive our office on this off offering on this morning, our ushers are here. If you need those of you that are in the sanctuary, if you need an offering envelope, please raise your hand. The ushers will be will serve you. As you all are preparing in your hearts, as you're giving unto God on today, I'd like to just review a few ways that we have for giving, amen, unto the Lord on today. We can text your giving to 901-235-1775. You can also cash app, use cash app to give, and that is the dollar sign 1-E-K-K. L E S I A. That's dollar sign one Ecclesia. And then, of course, we know we have the offering basket. Again, if you need an envelope, just let the ushers know. And you can mail in your offering. And I'll just remind you the address here Faith Christian Church is 4965 Willow Road, Memphis, Tennessee. 38117 and that information for those of you that are joining us virtually should be um, on your uh, screen at this time amen several ways of giving unto God amen amen looks like everyone here in the sanctuary has been served amen and what we will do at this time I want to go ahead and pray for our offering amen before our ushers um, come around and you will be governed uh, by them. Amen. Precious Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you at this time for this offering we are about to receive, Lord God. We thank you, God, for you being a provider of all things, O oh Lord. Lord, we ask that you bless each and every heart in this sanctuary, O oh God, and in virtual land. Bless those, O oh God, that have to give on this time, on this day, at this hour. Bless those who do not have to give at this time. Lord, we ask that you continue to increase them, O oh God. Bless, Lord God. Bless ten. 50 a hundredfold oh God as they give unto you God a portion of what you have blessed them with oh God for we know that it all belongs to you Lord Jesus we ask that you continue to increase oh God bless all oh God that we put our hands unto and we thank you Lord at this time for this offering in Jesus name we pray amen Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Again, we thank you. Amen for being a part of our service, even those of you that gave, those if you didn't have to give at this time, we pray that Lord will bless you, that you will have to give the next time. Amen. We thank you how you've participated thus far in our service. We're shortly going to begin our praise and worship. And again, that is an opportunity for everyone to join in and participate. But before we do, I just wanted to mention a couple of announcements as we are uh, closing out the month of January. First of all, we wanna thank all of you all that were here this morning for our communion service, amen. We're beginning our first fast of this year, our first fruits fast, and we just thank God. We know that God is going to bless. Hear those prayer requests as we go throughout this week. Again, the fast, remember, keep in mind that it is um, the first fruits fast. It's all fruits and vegetables. So please make sure you govern yourselves accordingly. Make sure you're hydrating um, as well. So we will continue our fast. It started this morning 
at 7 a.m. The fast will continue through next Sunday, first Sunday in February at 7 a.m. 7 a. That's when our fast will conclude. So again, we're looking forward to God doing great things this week during our fast. Amen. We just thank him. Expectancy is high. We always have to keep our expectancy is high because we serve a great and a powerful God, saints. Amen. We know that we can cast our cares upon him. Amen. That he will hear and he will answer our prayers. Also, we had our church business meeting this past Wednesday. Um, contribution statements are available. Please see Sister Lacey today. She has those statements for you. Make sure that you will be required to sign when you receive your um, church contribution statement for uh, 2022. So please make sure you see Sister Lacey um, at the conclusion of service today for those statements. Also, I want to um, remind everyone that next month, February. February is almost here, and we know it's customary that we um, continue to acknowledge Black History Month, our heritage. And so one thing we want to do just as a display of that um, camaraderie, what we would like is to ask that you each Sunday that you don yourselves with your African garb, please do so each Sunday um, come to come as you come into the um, house of God make sure um, that if you have it please don't go out spending lots of money buying things but if you have um, some African attire we ask that you please wear it during each Sunday during the month of February so whether it is a daishiki a skirt a full on garb a head wrap whatever you have amen feel free to join in as we continue to celebrate um, our history, our heritage um, during the month of February. And lastly, the final announcement I would like to make is we are asking that the small um, containers for the oil that you are often at the front door, the small containers of oil over the years, if you have been um, receiving those containers, we ask that you please return them so that we can refill them. This way we can continue to recycle those glass, those little bottles. So if you have any empty ones at home, please bring those back to the sanctuary. We'll have a basket or something out there that you can place them in so that we can continue to re refill those, okay? So please bring those back so that we can refill the, um, the small bottles of oil, amen. All right, that concludes our announcements at this time. I will bring before you Sister Tessa. She is going to further usher us, lead in, facilitate. She is not going to take you into worship. She is going to allow and facilitate the process. Amen. As we glorify God, amen, at this time. Let us all receive Sister Tessa with the words of praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and stand on your feet. I just want to sing a few blood songs this morning. Is that okay? We already sung a few of them this morning before communion, so you know the words. So just help me sing them, okay? Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, singing glory to his name, we're singing glory to his name, glory
precious name, singing glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of God, singing glory to his name. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His graces? Out? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Said, Are you washed in the blood? In the Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you trust each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Say, are you washed in the blood?
nothing but the blood. 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 It was nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. It was nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for your blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died. And I know it was the blood for me. It was my Savior's blood. It was my Savior's blood. It was my Savior's blood for me. One day. They pierced him in his side. Yes, they pierced him in his side for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross. And I know. hung his head and died. He hung his head and died. Yes, he hung his head and died for me. One day I know it was the blood for me. Now they laid him in the tomb. They laid him in a tomb. Yes, they laid him in a tomb for me. When they After that, he rose up from the dead. He rose up from the dead. He rose up from the dead for me. Yes, he did. One day when I was lost, yes, Jesus died. And now I know it was the blood for me. The 
this the last one. This is my favorite part. He's coming back again. Yes, he's coming back again. He's coming back again for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross, and I know. Yes, I know it was the blood. Yes, I know it was the blood. It was the blood for me. Hallelujah. If you know it was the blood for you, go ahead and praise him. Hallelujah. Thank you for the blood, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for us, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Wonderful, Jesus. Thank you. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Have your way, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. We're so grateful for all that God has been doing, is doing, will do. Our confidence and our faith rooted in him. We appreciate this time that we had this morning for communion. And now, as we've embarked on a fast and consecration period, we just want to always keep God at the very forefront of our minds. Today, we're going to continue as we started out last week, we, we talked about the fact that over the coming months, we're going to be talking a lot about hearts and minds. And that's because uh, that is where change takes place. You can't change a person by just coming up with some rules. If you don't change their heart and their mind, you're not going to get any compliance. I think we live in a day and age where the church has gotten lazy, and now we want to legislate. We want to appoint Supreme Court justices. We're trying to do everything but uh, disciple. 
God has called us to change hearts and minds, not change legislation, not change politicians, change the composition of the three branches of government here. I'm not saying don't vote, you need to vote. And, but what we have to realize is we spend a lot of time in areas that God didn't empower us with. We want to change the trajectory of society. We've got to change the hearts and minds of the individuals that comprise society, and it starts with us. We've got to work on ourselves. So we're going to look at two passages of Scripture today. Uh, the first is found in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, and we're going to read verses 5 through 9. Then we're going to turn to 2 Kings chapter number 6, and we're going to look at verses 15 through 18. These are both passages of scripture that I'm sure all of us have seen before. And I'm just grateful that every time I look in the scriptures, it's like looking at it brand new. I can read the same scripture over and over again and get something new each time. Because the word of God is alive. A force to give us life. To help us to be liberated. And we're grateful for it. So again, that's 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, uh, excuse me, chapter number 5, verses 5 through 9. And 2 Kings chapter number 6 verses 15 through 18. Just want to make sure that everyone can find it. If there's someone near you that does not have a Bible or is having challenges finding the scriptures, you wouldn't mind just helping them out so that they can see that I'm not up here just making stuff up. It's important that people see for themselves what thus saith the Lord. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 5 through 9, and 2 Kings chapter number 6, verses 15 through 18. If you have it, if you would please signify by saying amen. I'll read these for your hearing. And it reads in 2 Corinthians 5, 5, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing, is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Second Kings chapter number 6, verses 15 through 18. And it reads, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. So as we embark on this, this journey, we're going to be talking about the, the struggle 
And in fact, the, the overall theme for the messages that I'll be preaching over the coming months is going to be why we struggle. And then uh, we will get into specifics, but I, I want to make sure I clarify a couple of things because the word struggle has a negative connotation for most people. Struggle means you're losing uh, to a lot of people. But that's not the correct definition of struggle. If you understand, struggle and wrestle can be synonymous. And the definition of struggle is a determined effort under difficulties. A determined effort under difficulties. That means that when times are tough, you're still putting in effort. That doesn't sound like losing to me. And so the word struggle shows up once in the scriptures. And the synonym wrestle shows up four times. Once in the New Testament and three times in the Old. And to wrestle means to get dusty with effort meaning you're going to get down in the dirt. You're not avoiding getting dusty. To move or to manipulate something in a specified way with difficulty and some exerted effort. In the New Testament setting, the Greek speaks to a contest between two in which each endeavors to throw the other and which is decided when the victor is able to hold his opponent down. And so when we think about why we struggle, it's because we have to realize that struggle is a necessary part of becoming successful at anything. You don't become an expert right out the gate um, doing anything but sin. Sin is the only thing that any of us become an expert doing right out of the womb. You don't have to teach a child how to sin. But anything else requires teaching, effort, practice. And so in this life, knowing that we are battling, we are wrestling against the principalities, not flesh and blood, then what we have to recognize is that you got two options. Either you're going to struggle or you're going to get dragged. Because if you don't put up a fight, you're going you're gonna to lose. And so if we understand this, we have to understand that whatever we're doing for God is not going to be easy. Nothing in life that's meaningful is ever easy. heard the saying and it's 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 one that it's it's true it's it's a truism it, it's so true that you know sometimes we take for granted but if it was easy everybody would be doing it and the reality of the matter is the reason why most people aren't doing it is because it's not easy people want to do easy things not hard things so the struggle that we go through if we're willing to struggle is to say that we're not going to lose this battle. And because we're not going to lose this battle, we have to learn some techniques that are going to help us not fall prey to the tricks of the enemy. Now, one of the things that causes us to struggle is the fact that we are dependent on our natural senses. And so today we're going to deal with one of our senses, and that is a sense of sight. And I think it's important for us to understand how this causes struggle. And so we're going to speak from the subject today, don't let my eyes obstruct my vision. Don't let my eyes obstruct my vision. 
we find ourselves oftentimes, if we are studying the scriptures, if we're praying like we ought, getting guidance and insights from God that con contradicts what our eyes are telling us. And there are times where we see things and it's difficult to reconcile the fact that what we see, we shouldn't believe. And if you've walked with God for any period of time, you've come to realize that God doesn't want you to allow your natural eyes to determine what the outcome's going to be. And so we have to learn a few things. And one thing we do know is that seeing takes place in the eyes. But vision takes place in the mind. And so if we understand that, then we can understand how sometimes there's going to be a disconnect between what we see with our eyes and the vision that God has given. And so as I look at these passages of scripture that we have here, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, uh, verse 5 and through 9, these are very um, familiar passages of scripture, but uh, more so, people are familiar with verse number 8. and But they don't have the full context of what God is saying here. Because you hear people say, we walk by faith, but not by sight. And not rarely do we realize that that's parenthetical information. If your Bible's like my Bible, verse number 7 is in parentheses. Meaning that it's put in there for clarification. Not as a standalone thought. And what it was saying is that we are always confident. And why are we always confident? Is because we understand that uh, one thing is when we get comfortable in our flesh, we should realize that we're not in the presence of God. Your flesh is going to cause you to act and to think in a certain way that's not welcoming to God. And so when you're very comfortable with what your flesh is doing, you ought to know that you're not doing the will of God. When our flesh is uncomfortable, that's a better indicator that we're doing the will of God than when our flesh is comfortable. Pampering your flesh is not the way to heaven is not the way of God. And so it's important for us to see this. So what is Paul talking about here? We know that people have created a brand new theology from this passage of scripture. In fact, they put everybody in heaven, whether it be uh, you know uh, somebody who they know good and well never repented, he put animals, anything into heaven, everything's a home going now. And, and it's a function of them misunderstanding what verse eight is talking about. This is how most people read verse number eight. We are confident, I say, and willing because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You show me where it is to be is in that scripture. It's not there. Because Paul is not saying to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's not saying that when you die, you go and be with the Lord immediately. That is not a theology that Paul was preaching because Paul in separate scripture said that those who die in Christ shall be caught up first and those that are alive and remain shall be caught up with him. How are they going to rise if they're already there? What, what's happened is people start misinterpreting scripture to create a doctrine that was never to, supposed to be a doctrine. What Paul is talking about in the scripture is when you get too comfortable in the flesh, you'll be looking for fleshly solutions. When you're so comfortable in the flesh, you're not going to consider God. You're not going to consider God's ways, his desires, the things that are important to God. You're going to consider what the flesh wants. 
Now think about it. We find ourselves in a bind, we start looking for fleshly solutions. Money get a little tight, we start looking for the flesh to go to work and get a little bit of money. And we're a little bit discouraged, we're trying to find ways in the flesh to resolve the challenges that we're facing. What God is trying to get us to understand, saints, is that when we can get to the place where we're not comfortable in the flesh, but we're comfortable in the spirit, we're going to then find ourselves getting insights and guidance. We're going to see ourselves getting solutions that are enduring solutions, not temporary fixes. Have you ever noticed that the the flesh solutions are like dollar store solutions. They only last temporarily. They're only good for a few minutes. They don't give you long-term satisfaction because they're not designed for endurance. They're not designed to have longevity. They're not designed to be permanent. That's why uh, the scriptures tell us that those things that are seen are not made of things that appear. What we're basically saying is that the things that we see are temporal, but the things we can't see are eternal. And the reason is because our eyesight is not capable of seeing eternal things. Our eyes are not capable of seeing the things that are undergirding the things that we can see. But in the, in the mind of God and in the eyes of faith, God is able to show us some things that the flesh can't see. That's why this is important, that why we struggle is we struggle because we're leaning too much on the fleshly sight and not enough on the guidance that God has given us. God would rather us be blinded physically and walking in the spirit because that is the vision that he has for us. See, understanding that vision is the ability to imagine and think into the future with insights, knowing that the future is going to be different than what I see right now. Uh, the problem that many of us have is that we're so caught up in what we're dealing with in our current circumstances that our mind can't elevate over what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the acute pain of what we're going through right now. We can't get our minds to think beyond the pain that we're going through at the moment. And God is saying that is because you're dwelling on what you can see what you can experience with your temporal uh, senses. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is that if you're able to elevate a beyond what you're going through, you're going to be able to see some things that your eyes can't show you. I say this because it reminds me, and Sister Gwen, while I was picking her up last night from the airport, she said that, did y'all have rain or did y'all have uh, storms and wind? Because we ran into a lot of turbulence up there in the sky. And what I was thinking about at that time is that sometimes the turbulence is just at a certain altitude. See, some people who are walking around on the ground level don't experience much turbulence. But as you're elevating, you got to go through a little bit of turbulence. But the point that I want to give you to really understand this is that I remember times being on the airplane and we were going through some things and the turbulence was so bad that it was knocking some of the compartments open. And one of the things that people would probably say is get us down to the ground. But one thing I realized is in that moment, God was giving us a spiritual understanding is that when things get tough, when life gets turbulent, the solution is not to go earthly. The solution is to go heavenly. So that is when the pilot came on over the intercom and said, buckle your seatbelts. We're going to a higher altitude. See, we've got to go through this turbulence, but we're going a little bit higher. And as we go higher, we're going to see what we were going through. We'll be able to look down at our circumstance and be able to understand what it was really about. But the problem for so many of us, we allow our eyes to overlook and overpower our vision. We allow our eyes to obstruct what God wants us to see. So I'm here to tell you now, you've got to learn how not to let your eyes obstruct God's vision. You've got to allow God to show you some things in the spirit that your fleshly eyes just can't see.
And so I'm reminded here in this passage of scripture, 2 Kings chapter number 6, what we have there is the Syrians were very upset. They had started a war with Israel, and that war was one that was getting heated. And the king of Syria consulted his people. He said, I'm going to go into this city and that city, and I'm going to destroy the Israelites. And that's when Elisha got the word from God, and he told the king of Israel that the king of Syria is going to meet you in this city. The king of Syria is going to meet you in that city. So my recommendation is that you go put yourself over in that location. And so after a period of time, the king of Syria looked at his men, said, which one of you is working for Israel? Which one of you is snitching on me? Because every time I've got them cornered, they find a way of escape. But I'm here to tell you that when your ways pleases God, he'll make preparation to telegraph the enemy's punches. God will give you insights that your fleshly eyes just can't see. So what happened here is that because they were angry at what he had done, they found out that, look, it was none of us that was telling on you, king. It's that Elisha. He's been telling everybody what was going on in your bedchamber. He's the one who disclosed your plans and secrets. Let me just pause for a moment because we're right here in church. See, when your mind is right and your heart is right, when the preacher preaches and that thing hits you some kind of way, you say, thank you for giving me a word. That word was for me. But if your mind and your heart ain't right, when that word go forth, why was the preacher preaching on me? Your heart and your mind is the differentiator. We got a lot of people right now crying church hurt over circumstances where it was being preached, but their heart and their mind wasn't in a good place. So they assumed somebody told the preacher all my business. Somebody told the preacher about what I did done. But I'm here to tell you, your lifestyle, your ways are not secret from the almighty God. God sees where you are. God sees what you're doing and it's his desire his good pleasure to send instruction to lead you out of a bad heart and a bad mind and bad circumstance so what happened here the king of Syria was so angry that he said I'm going down to Elisha's house and I'm gonna teach him don't mess with me so he showed showed up with a big army of lots of people. And here's Elisha's servant. He looked out the window. He saw all those warriors, all those chariots, all the soldiers compassing them about. But I'm here to tell you, don't do like this servant did. Because he asked a question. He said, Master, how shall we do? What he meant was, what can we do? How can we, as weak as we are, how can we, as few as we are, how is we, as broke as we are, how can we, as feeble as we are, do anything against this multitude? Then Elisha, with the different mindset, with a different heart towards God, he said, don't you worry that there are more with us than are with them. I can only imagine his servant looked out the window again. Then he looked back. It's two of us, thousands of them. What do you mean? There's more with us than there is with them. 
this is when uh, Elisha prayed. He sought God. He said, God, don't let my servant's eyes obstruct the vision. Let him see what I already see. Let him believe what I already believe. Let him consider all the facts, not just the facts. He can see with his eyes. Let him see the totality of the circumstance. So at that moment, his eyes were opened and behind enemy lines were the host of the living God. Fiery chariots, warriors ready. I thank God that sometimes when I go into battle, I'm looking with my fleshly eyes and I feel overwhelmed. I feel cast down. I feel discouraged. But the spirit of the living God makes intercessions, groanings that cannot be uttered and intervenes on my behalf. And God then downloads into my spirit, into my heart, into my mind a new vision of what my future will look like. So instead of me consulting my circumstance, the spirit says, God, don't let my eyes obstruct the vision. Don't let my eyes obstruct the vision. See, many of us have worried ourselves to death over something that never happened. I, I think many of us, I wish I could have those years back. I sat there worrying about a future that never arrived. Some of us ain't never been evicted, but yet we worried about it. Some of us have never been fired, but we've received many a pink slip in, in our mind. Have a little knot here or that. We, we, we've been diagnosed with all kinds of stuff in our mind that never touched us. How does this happen? We're struggling. We're wrestling with our natural senses. Our flesh is telling us the best it can based on temporal data. That's all the flesh knows. But the spirit can show us things that the flesh can never understand. That's why when the scriptures say, ear hath not heard, eyes have not seen, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. That's why the next verse said, but he revealed it to them through the spirit. This is why, saints, it's so important for us to learn that just like you learn how to walk, you learn how to talk. You learn how to do so many different things. You're going to have to learn how to trust the spirit of God when it is in opposition to your senses. See, God's going to walk you down some streets where you can't trust your eyes. You're going to have to trust the vision of God. You can't trust your ears. You're going to have to trust the vision of God. You're not going to be able to trust your sense of smell or your sense of taste or all these different things. You're going to have to trust the vision of God. And so just like the servant of Elisha, we ask this question. What are we going to do? This thing is so bad. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm so stressed out. What am I going to do? That's the wrong question. 
The better question is, God, what are you going to do? I, I realize that now I'm beyond my capabilities. I'm beyond my skill set. And, and see, this is why I remember I preached this message years ago. I'm in over my head, and I love it. Uh, because what you have to realize is that there are going to be times in your life your skills have run out. <laughs> your education has run out. Your friendships have run out. Your bank account has run out. Everything that you would rely on is gone. All you got left is the almighty God. But I'm here to tell you, if all you got is God on your side, you got everything that you'll ever need. Because God, he said he'll give you all things concerning life and godliness. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take. But in this time, in this age, and in, in, in what we're going through this year, saints, I want to prepare you. I could easily stand up here like, like the traveling evangelist and say, money cometh. You know, send me $100. I'll send you this cloth. I, I even, I'll get you some water and send it to you. Wh whatever the, the scams are. But the point is, as a pastor, I got to stay here next week when that stuff don't happen and pick up the pieces. And so I'm here to tell you the truth. I'm here to tell you what God can do and what he's unwilling to do for somebody who's not committed. See, you ain't going to bribe God. You're not going to buy God. What you're going to do is you're going to supplicate and put yourself in the presence of God. And so God is basically saying this. We are in a world right now that is full of chaos. I was talking to the kids the other night. I said, why is it that Memphis is on national news so frequently for all the wrong reasons? We have been on national news at least four times in the last nine months for nothing good. And so we're in a messed up environment. The human condition is on full display. We're seeing some of the worst instincts of human beings. So we're seeing all that. We're on the verge of an economic recession. Seeing mass layoffs all over the place. And what God could easily do is say, it's time to rapture my people. We know, know the day or the hour when that's going to happen. So what we have to do is we have to prepare that in the midst of crisis, in the midst of chaos, we have to be able to keep our joy. And this is something that we're going to have to discover this year. How to have joy when you're hungry. How to have joy when you don't have any money. How to have joy when you're in pain. How to have joy when you're also grieving. How to have joy when your circumstances do not line up with what somebody may have promised you was going to happen when you got saved. The point is, this is a year for us to discover how to trust God regardless of what our circumstances look like. So what I'm, I'm, I'm imploring you, I, I really want you to listen to this and listen closely. We don't need to be sounding like Elijah's servant that when circumstances come our way, our first response is, what we going to do? What I'm going to do? How am I going to get out of this? How am I going to fix this? I'm not saying it's not human nature. I'm not saying it's not something that's going to come to your mind. But you're going to have to learn how to suppress your instinct to go out and do something in the flesh to resolve something that's coming your way. Because God is trying to teach us to rely less on the flesh and more on the spirit. He's trying to get us to a place where when we look around, there is no savior but him. We can't be the savior. Our friends can't be the savior. Our spouse can't be the savior. Our boss can't be the savior. Let me just, just share this little piece of information. And hopefully this will help 
both in the secular as well as in the spiritual. Some of you should be grateful that you're not the boss at a job. Because what happens is you don't have people coming to you asking you some stuff that you got to say no to. And some people get themselves in a terrible financial state for a number of reasons. And then they come to their boss and say, I'd like to get a raise. It's okay. What value have you brought to the organization to justify the raise? So you, 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 you got a raise, say, a year ago. What have you done different this year beyond what got you to raise last year that justifies you getting more money? And usually they don't have a good answer. Because they might recite the job description. Well, I'm doing this, this. Yeah, that's why you were hired. That, that's, that's what the salary is for. So if you want more, you're going to have to do more. Well, you know, I'm having some hard times. You know, I've got some bills that are piled up. Let me just be very clear to you, saints. Your employer's job is not to give you a raise because you mismanaged your money. So let me, let, me, let, me, let me put this in the spiritual context. Because you are sorrowful because of your circumstances, because things aren't working out the way you want them to work out, that is not going to move God. Now, I've told you this on several occasions. God is not Ellen DeGeneres. God is not Oprah Winfrey. You can, you can bring the most sorrowful sob story that you want to bring to God. He's not moved by your tears. He's not moved by the lack of movement in your life. He's not moved by your circumstances. I just want us to understand this. You could be in dire straits. That does not move God. That's a cold God, some people might say. What kind of careless God would, would not be moved by my crocodile tears? The same God that hasn't heard you say, I love you. The same God that hasn't heard, I trust you. The same God that hasn't heard, I'm going to give it all to you, God. Uh, not the one that, that is waiting for you to say, God, I know I'm in terrible circumstances. In fact, these are circumstances I created myself. This is a mess of my own doing. But God, I surrender unto you. God, I trust that you can bring me out of these circumstances. God. I've tried to do it myself, but I recognize I keep messing it up. So right now, God, I'm turning it all over to you. God, help me because I trust you. See, those are some good words. If God has not heard, I trust you. Don't expect him to come deliver you. It's like, who would want to keep giving and giving and giving to somebody who seems to be ungrateful? He wrote, he wrote a book of love letters to us, telling us how much he loved us. He said, well, when he said, how did he, how did he, how did he show it? You know, words are cheap. How did he show it? God so loved the world that he did what? See, he was willing to give it all for us. What are we willing to give up for him? I'm, I'm just here to tell you, saints, this is going to be a trying year for those who are unwilling to trust God. Why? I'm, and I'm not saying those who are trusting God and those who are not trusting God, circumstances are going to be much different. One thing's for certain is that if you start building a relationship with God,
if you start getting your mind right with God, you start getting your heart right with God, when all hell breaks loose, you still got to shout in a dance. When everything's falling apart around you, you still got a smile on your face because you've got that joy that's unspeakable. You've got that peace that passeth all understanding. You've got that thing that only comes from the almighty God. See, when I think back how Jesus went through all kinds of circumstances, he was lied on, he was spat on, he was whipped and bruised, he was beaten, but this Jesus stayed on assignment. What am I saying here? That same spirit that kept Jesus for 33 years is here on earth is the same spirit that when he said I send you another comforter that will be with you I thank God that the spirit on the inside of me allows me no matter how bad my circumstances I have joy I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm telling you, saints, when I mentioned on New Year's Eve that God allowed me to taste some of this in 2022 so that I could be a tour guide in 2023, I'm not talking about what I heard somebody say. I'm not quoting some folk I watched their YouTube video trying to use it as sermon prep. I'm talking from experience. I'm talking about going through some situations where my eyes were obstructing the vision of God. But I thank God that in those times of prayer, God said, don't look with the natural eye because it can't see the vision that I've got in store hold fast trust me you will have what you need when you need it so I'm grateful I'm grateful for the sneak preview and I'm not saying it was comfortable but what I can say, it was valuable. So I know that I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna come to to God trying to get something from Him by showing uh my, this is my job description, these are my accomplishments, this is my resume. I know now I come to God, and if I want something to happen, I just I just lay before God and just supplicate in his presence. I don't even have to ask him for anything because God has sense enough to know what I have need of. He said, consider the lilies of the valley. They got the best outfits. They looking sharp. They be on the front cover of Vogue, but they ain't gone to work. They ain't done nothing but allow God to dress them up and prepare them just to turn out to be like grass two days later. If you've ever been down the highway, you see the flowers bloom. Two days later, they brown and shriveled up. What am I saying here? God is beautifying some things that last two days, but he's given us three score at 12. So I thank God. How much more will he clothe me? How much more will he bless me? Because he's put inside of me his spirit you think you think this God who's beautifying flowers that don't have a soul is not going to take care of you I hope this message aggravates you all year long and the reason I'm saying that is because I just want you to be pushed to the place where you realize you don't have nothing and nobody but God.
Because when you find yourself in that place, your friendships are going to get better. Because you're not expecting them to be God in your life. See, your relationship's going to get better. Your work life going to get better. Because you realize why I'm killing myself. This thing ain't my source. So you got to realize something. When you understand who your only friend is. The friend that stick it closer than any brother. The almighty God. The grand architect of everything has said. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's my friend. He's got my back so when I find myself when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock that's higher than I so you may not you may not know me well but one thing I do want you to know about me if you find me discouraged you find me down. Don't take me out to the movies. I don't need a guy's night out. What I need you to do is bring me to the sanctuary. Lay me before the altar. Do like the friends of the paraplegic man. Rip the roof off the house. Lower me down in the presence of Jesus. And say, Jesus, my friend, he he needs you. That's what I want you to do for me. If you ever find me in that condition, take me to Jesus because he's the only one that can help. So I just think, I just, I'm wrapping up here. And this is even less than a preacher minute. I, wa I want you to see this. God wants us to trust him. And I know many of us, we've been in toxic relationships where the person tried to uh, isolate us from our family, isolate us from our friends, so they could just do a, a, a work on our minds. And so we have that in the back of our minds that we're having a hard time trusting Jesus. We'll take baby steps. But don't forfeit this opportunity to know the almighty God. And if you don't have his spirit, the scriptures are clear. You are none of his you don't have to go to Maury Povich and get the test. Say, this is so-and-so. They have not been filled with the Holy Ghost. God, you are not the Father. <laughs> and they, they can run around the place all like that. <laughs> but that's not going to make him be any more the Father. The only thing that is going to have God be your father is to hear you cry like a newborn baby when the Spirit of God makes utterance the speaking of that sound. Because the scripture said that we that are born of the flesh are flesh, born of the Spirit are spirit. Such of all of those that are born of the Spirit. Just as the wind moves it where it listed, and you hear the sound thereof. What am I saying here? There is a sound of the spirit. Maybe I just leave that to when we talk about the sense of hearing. But saints, as we stand and as the ministers come, I want you to know this is a perfect day. For you to make the decision that if I have not repented of my sins, if I have not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins, and if I have not been filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, I am spiritually dead. 
and I want to be alive. And so if I want to be alive, I have to experience the new birth. Jesus in John chapter number three spoke very clearly. He said, marvel not that you must be born again. So if you're here and you have not repented, we'll repent with you. All you're doing is telling God that you acknowledge that you've fallen short and that you're prepared to turn in the other direction. We know that turning you can do, living you can't. So turning from sin is something we all can do in the flesh. But that's why God wants to give you the spirit so that once you turn, you don't have to turn back. And so you're dying to sin. And when you die to sin, you need to be buried. Buried in that liquid grave where you are being buried in that name, that matchless name, that name that has been given amongst men under heaven whereby we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus. And so if you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, this is your opportunity. You can surrender. You can submit yourself to the baptism. But the error for many is they think that they've accomplished something just by going down in water. But you've got to be born again. You need a new nature. Your Adamic nature is still there. And so you need the spirit of the living God dwelling on the inside of you. You have to be raised to the newness of life. And so you have to be born of the spirit. So if you don't have the spirit of God, we'll tarry with you. But do not forfeit your opportunity to the kingdom, allowing your natural senses to tell you, I got time. There's a lot of people who thought they had time and never made it into 2023. There's a lot of people who thought they had time and never made it to today. And there's going to be some that think they have time and won't see tomorrow. So if you're here, this is your opportunity. Perhaps there's some tuning in on Facebook and they say, I want to be saved. You can send your information to altarprayer at fccapostolic.org or even pastor at fccapostolic.org. I will receive those messages and I will reach out to you. Same if you just have a prayer request, a petition. You just need God to do something. And that goes for those that are here in the sanctuary. We have ministers here that can pray with you, pray for you. Or you can just come straight to the altar and lay at the altar and petition God for yourself. But don't allow this opportunity to pass you by. Don't squander this opportunity. I think all of us, sometime in our life, have a regret that I wish I had done something before it was too late. This is your opportunity to surrender to God before it's everlasting too late. Let us look to God right now in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for this opportunity to come before your presence. And so, God, we, we love you. We appreciate you. And we need you to help us to not allow our eyes to obstruct the vision. So right now, we know that some of us are aching, we, we have pain, but we just don't really know the cause. It's not just a physical hurt, it's an emotional, psychological hurt. It's plaguing us in ways that it's causing difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping, difficulty 
being able to remember. We're just maybe struggling, God, but we thank you for giving us the fight to struggle. And we're asking, God, that you would help to lead us through these situations that no matter how dark it might get, no matter how challenging it might become, help us to have joy. That joy that only you can give. Let us have peace. Let us recognize that you're able to bring us out. But even if you don't, you're able. And so we're going to take a Selah moment and just allow you to speak to our hearts. Sister Lacey can sing softly. We thank you, God. grateful God so all the prayers all the petitions all the care and concern we leave at the altar and we're going to consider it done Lord we'll leave it in your hands and it's in Jesus name we pray amen amen so we're just going to extend that invitation to anyone who may have been coming and spending time whether it's virtual or in person and you just feel like Faith Christian Church is the place where you can grow, where you can develop, and it's also a place where you can actively serve. If you feel inclined and inclined to make that move, we're extending that invitation to you right now. You can come and, and have that opportunity. Amen. So thank you, ministers. We're going to get prepared to wrap up again our fast began this morning at 7 a.m. and will continue to 7 p.m. I'm mean, excuse me 7 a.m. next Sunday we are in our first fruits fast which is essentially a vegan fast no animal products and what we're focusing in on is we we always know that when you First fruits is all about redeeming the rest by giving God the first. And so this is a time where we're laying before God, crying out for some change we would like to see through the balance of this year. We here in Memphis know that this year has not gotten off to a good start. Lost lives all kinds of natural challenges, power outages, contaminated water. We've experienced all kinds of plagues just in this first month. And God, we are looking for you to do something special. And so we're going to give of ourselves by sacrificing. I said, well, giving up meat ain't much of a sacrifice. Anytime you give up anything, the flesh wants is a sacrifice because the flesh starts wanting it more. We talked about this the other day. You don't even you don't you don't even you don't even eat salad, but you say, "Okay, we're going to do a salad-free fast." All of a sudden, now you're craving salad. It's something about the flesh to desire what it can't have. And so, this is an opportunity for us to afflict our flesh, take dominion and continue to remind the flesh that we're going to be led by the Spirit. 
and these messages that we're going to be speaking from talking about hearts and minds and and how we have to find ways to serve God despite what our senses are telling us over these next few weeks we're going to see God trying to reprogram our mindset so we'll be ready to navigate this decade to come and so that's kind of where we're going to wrap up we're going to get ready to dismiss and so if you would uh, oh yeah and just a reminder it is Black History Month next month so feel free you don't have to but feel free to wear your African attire um, for the entire month and if you will with uplifted hands if you will repeat after me trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths in Jesus name amen God bless you in Jesus name